Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In diffusion flames we could actually look at two situations that are slightly different from each other. One is uh, a co-flow diffusion flame or the other one is a counterflow, counterflow diffusion flame. We will talk a little bit about each of these. The reason why we aim to talk about a co-flow diffusion flame is because we are essentially we are now talking about two different reactants that are approaching each other. The question is when you, say, when you, now, when you now say flow you are now talking about how do they convect okay. Previously uh, earlier uh, we were talking about how they mix with each other. Mixing is essentially depending upon primarily the, temp, the, the concentration gradient that is prevailing uh, for each species to mix into each other. But uh, the question, the question about the configuration of the flame is, how do the reactants flow um, to each other? Uh, in the case of premixed flames, when we are saying premixed, that means the reactants were mixed with each other, so that means they flow together. There is no way you're going to have the uh, the reactants flow from different sides or something of that sort, right? But but not the, the moment you're now talking about diffusion flames, where the reactants are uh, reactants are coming from uh, coming differently and then they have to mix at the flame then you could now begin to talk about these things right. So uh, a co-flow uh, diffusion flame would a, a typical configuration would be where you have for example in a duct you have a splitter plate and you have a uh, fuel on one side and oxidizer on the other side and the splitter plate terminates at the lip of a, uh, at its lip and then uh, you now have a mixing region that means as the flow is going up like this the fuel mixes like this and the oxidizer mixes like that right and somewhere in there you are expecting a flame to happen because that is the flame is where they mix with each other right. So this is a this is what is called as a co-flow configuration there are several situations which actually mimic this this for example if you now think about like a Bunsen burner right. So you have a fuel that is coming in the oxidizer is actually ambient it is not exactly flowing but effectively you have a flow that is being set up by the fuel and of course the products are also actually flowing outward because they are hot and in a buoyancy driven flow they basically go outward or upward and therefore uh, you have an entrainment of the air. So the entrainment of the air uh, is also causing a, a locally co-flow situation as far as the flame is concerned and uh, um, you, could, you could also have like a burner within a duct uh, where you have a fuel in the middle and oxidizer in the outer annulus and so on. So all these things are basically like a co-flow situation. A counter flow situation is where you are essentially uh, trying to have um, fuel come in this, uh, this way and oxidizer coming this way and um, you now see if you do not want to have any shear layer effects in the co-flow case you would now say equal velocities for both the fuel, fuel and oxidizer that means this is coming in at a velocity u this is coming in at a velocity u same same velocity so you do not you do not necessarily have like a shear layer between the two and you are focusing mainly on the species mixing rather than any momentum mixing and all that stuff. Similarly you could also think about in the counter flow situation a, a, a counter flow at the same velocity for example. So if you now think about this and typical examples would be like what is called as an opposed jet burner. So if you now have like a jet here and a jet here this is like the nozzle for the jet or the um, uh, the jet uh, um, mouth if you will and uh, then um, essentially they are they are now apart by about a distance h let us say right and then they are coming in with a certain velocity. So what this is going to do is uh, you are going to have a flow that is going to go like that right and as the fuel is flowing like this and the oxidizer is flowing like this they are mixing with each other and when they mix with each other somewhere in there not necessarily in the middle of the flow but somewhere in there you are going to have a flame that is uh, that is a diffusion flame right and this is a flame uh, 
where you can actually hope to establish something that is very flat. The flame would be quite flat because the mixing is going to happen uh, equally on both sides except now the problem is you do not have a uniform velocity field for the flame. In fact you are now going to have what is called the high strain rate here and the, and the flame is actually being stretched because of the flow wanting to actually go this way uh, on, on either side. As a matter of fact you could also have a premix flame configuration here in the, in the, in the opposed jet uh, burner. How, well, how would you do that? You could now have a fuel and oxidizer coming from the same nozzle let us say from the bottom and then you now send a opposed jet of inert gas let us say nitrogen right and what would this do? It would now create like a stagnation point flow. So this is essentially what is called as a stagnation point flow because by symmetry this would, this would be as if like you had one jet that is impinging on a wall. So if you now have a jet that is impinging on a wall it just spreads out and you have a stagnation point right at the middle right. So this creates like a stagnation point flow in the, in the middle and essentially the, both the flows together now are like mirror images of each other if the velocities are the same and so you have a stagnation point flow and you could have a premix flame which is flat which is subjected to a strain right that, that is an experiment to actually uh, investigate the effect of uh, the, the strain rate on the premix flame but the case of diffusion flame you can actually hope to get a flat diffusion flame as opposed to in this case what is going to happen is the flame could actually be curved be depending upon whether you have uh, a we will talk about this in greater detail pretty soon um, depending upon whether, whether depending upon the stoichiometry of the mixture right. So you, you could actually have a dilute mixture for the fuel or dilute mixture for the oxidizer for example if you use air then it is already diluted with a lot of nitrogen for the oxygen and uh, then it depends on the stoichiometric coefficients in the reaction like the, the stoichiometric coefficients means if you now we need more oxidizer for a given um, given amount of fuel for stoichiometric reaction and so on. So these things will actually dictate what the shape of the flame is but you cannot really expect to have a have a flat flame okay. So if you want to have and the reason why we would like to have a flat flame for example is if you want to treat it in a one dimensional manner right. Uh, but there are ways of one dimensionalizing these flames and so on. Uh, we will we'll discuss those things in greater detail but effectively you could think about uh, a, a two configurations like a co-flow and a counter flow geometry which makes more sense in the context of diffusion flames now. What we will do now is actually pick the co-flow geometry and then um, look at what is called as the Burke Schumann problem. Now the Burke Schumann problem is, is, a, is a very fundamental problem in fact it was, it was presented in, in the first symposium uh, on, on uh, combustion uh, in 1928 by Burke Schumann and it was subsequently uh, published in the Journal of Industrial Chemistry. Um, so it is a very celebrated piece of work and it is had numerous citations subsequently and lots of different extensions to this, prob this, this problem and the name the, the phrase Burke Schumann flame connotes a certain set of assumptions that, in, that, that it embodies and uh, it, it refers to certain limits of like very high activation energy, infinite rate chemistry and so on. So the Burke Schumann problem is as follows, I will I'll, I'll, I'll describe the problem first and then list out the assumptions that are involved in this. The Burke Schumann problem is essentially that of um, two concentric ducts. You could do this problem in, in, in a Cartesian coordinate system where you have like two channels right. So this is like infinite plates and this is also infinite plates. So these are essentially two co coaxial channels uh, or uh, you can also do this in the in an axisymmetric manner that means you are actually having two circular pipes that are concentric to each other and, and the original Burke Schumann problem was done as a, a pipe problem. So it is an axisymmetric problem and uh, the inner pipe terminates at a particular point the outer pipe extends to infinity. So the inner pipe is a semi infinite pipe it is coming from infinity b below and up to this point the outer pipe is infinite all the way right on, on, on either side and uh, you have a fuel coming in 
at a certain uh, certain uh, mass fraction y f naught inside on the on the inner duct, and you have uh, oxidizer coming in in the outer duct at uh, a oxidizer mass fraction of uh, y o naught. So these are the inlet mass fractions, all right, and they're also coming in at all. All all the flow, uh, both the flows are actually at the same velocity u. So it's actually uniform velocity, and we are basically supposing that you have a uniform flow everywhere at at this velocity. All right. We are going to adopt the Schwab-Zeldovich formulation, where we are going to solve only the species equation and the energy equation. Uh, perhaps we will we'll actually find that we will also make assum other assumptions that requires us to solve only the species equation and not the energy equation um, and we can decouple them. Uh, therefore we are not going to solve the momentum equation, we are going to prescribe the velocity field and the velocity field that we will prescribe here is just uniform velocity everywhere for every any, any point in the flow for any mixture whether you have only reactant, only product a mixture of uh, uh, reactant and product, uh, only product uh, or uh, only fuel, only oxidizer among the reactants whichever way right. So everywhere you are basically going to say the same velocity exists. Now of course this is not, the, this is not a good assumption okay. Um, for, for several reasons you could first of all think wait a minute I am looking at pipe flow should not I actually have something like a parabolic velocity profile if it is laminar right and then parabolic velocity profiles for the outer outer uh, uh, flow and so on. Uh, then what about the no slip boundary condition of these, of these walls for this velocity profile let us not worry about all those things. That is all a fluid mechanics persons problem okay. I am not going to worry about all these things I am going to worry only about the combustion problem. The second thing is we are, we are not going to bother about the density variation with temperature. So if the density varies with temperature then um, as if as there is a flame and the flow goes through the flame uh, it expands because of uh, thermal expansion and therefore when the density changes the velocity will change as well right and then you the velocity field will now depend on the flame but that that is now like a convoluted problem. I need to prescribe a flow field in order to actually work out the flame uh, and the flame is now going to change the flow field so what do I prescribe so that 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 is a problem that I, that, that I will have to reckon with if I have to couple the flow and the combustion problems together right. If I want to keep them separate I will simply have to prescribe a velocity field in, in spite of the flame that means I have to I should not worry about the effect of the flame on the flow field. This is reasonable because uh, up to uh, pretty much up to the point where the, the flow is heating the flame it is not expanding. So and it is a convective situation of all the all the flow that is going out. So all the expansion is happening downstream of the flame. So it's a it's a it's an approximation, all right, but still it, it it's, it's a reasonable one. Okay, so this is typically the problem. the The question that we are asking in this problem is, what is the flame shape? And and this is very very important when compared to what is the flame structure? Okay, uh, in the context of premix flames, I have clarified the distinction between a flame shape and a flame structure. So when we are looking at one dimensional premix flames right we were we were saying uh, let us look at the preheat zone, let us look at the reaction zone, let us look at how the temperature increases and then uh, tapers off and how does the, the reactant concentration falls in the preheat zone and then tapers off at a low value all these things and how does the reaction rate grow and all those things right. Now that is looking at the structure when you now look at the structure of the flame that means you are looking at the spatial variation in temperature profiles concentration profiles and reaction rate profiles and so on right. Shape of the flame in the context of premix flames was something to do with like a conical flame above a, a um, Bunsen burner or uh, a wedge flame in, a, in, in the case of a ramjet and so on. So that is like a gross thing and it is almost like we are looking at a sheet of a flame wherein you the structure really happens right and then the way we were actually handling it is by looking at the G equation and how the flame propagates with a certain flow speed and balances the normal component of the flow those things that, that is, is what we were doing. Here again we are it is sufficient for us the way Burke and Schumann posed this problem to work out the shape of the flame okay and uh, 
so what we are what we are expecting is the shape of the flame to look somewhat like this or somewhat like that right or somewhat like this I do not know that is something that I am going to work out. So if you can imagine like a like a candle flame is something that is like a teardrop kind of uh, shape right you could also have like a tent shaped flame or uh, if, if, if you had a fuel uh, if you had a lot of fuel that is trying to actually mix with the oxidizer the flame could open up right. Many times when you keep in mind when you when you are op, when you are looking at flames that are opening up it could be like a jet flame. So a jet flame is where uh, you could have like a very high velocity fuel and very low velocity oxidizer then you are mixing up in your mind the shear layer effects like momentum transport because of velocity gradients and, and you have a jet that is coming up entrainment and all those things okay. It is possible to think about all these things that we are talking about in that context also but the fact that you are having, having a uniform velocity is to remove any effects of shear layers from this and we are looking at only species mixing and no momentum mixing effects, no thermal mixing effects none of these things is brought into picture right. So it is it, a very nicely uh, post problem in the sense it clearly focuses on primarily two things one is that there are, there are only two things that are happening here primarily one you have a axial convection of species and when I say species we are, we are talking about reactants that are separate to begin with and then mixture of reactants somewhere in the middle and products also coming up uh, as we go and then fully products are later on. So you see it is not as nicely done as a one dimensional premix flame previously. So we had we had reactants here you had a flame you had products there right that was more and more of a black and white thing okay and, and with very, very, little, very little fuzziness. If you now go from here to there you have and then keep scanning across you will find all kinds of things that are happening up from, from the point where you had separate reactants and complete pro mixture products at the top right. So we have to now evolve how this flame shape is happening. So one of the things that is happening regardless of whether it is reactants that are separate or products that are combined is axial convection of species and it is balanced by radial diffusion of species okay. You also have some axial diffusion all right I will I'll, I'll explain this a lot more carefully some little, little later but the two primary things that are of most importance in a Bergschumann diffusion flame are axial convection and radial diffusion. So this is the balance that we are basically talking about which is how well do the species diffuse while they are busy convecting right. This is what is going to dictate how the flame shapes up right so the flame shape is essentially di dictated by the balance of axial convection and radial diffusion. So once, once you get the flame shape the question of industrial interest for you is what is the flame height right. So for example if you now want to design a furnace or a burner uh, or a combustor and so on and you want to light up a flame at the burner you want to know how long you want to have the combustor walls right. So you want to be able to cover um, up until the, the tip of the flame at least so that you can ensure complete combustion within the combustor. So the, the type the, 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 the height of the flame is, is, is of practical interest right. So the way Burke, Schumann, Burke and Schumann actually tried to get the flame height was to actually solve for the flame shape and once you get the flame shape you now find out where, where it actually stops at the center line or at the walls. Uh, what is the vertical distance over which it spans and that is the height of the flame right. So you can, you, can, you can obtain this. So this is basically the way the problem is posed and the solution procedure is to go through the shape of the flame. So the, the adopt the, 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 adopt the, uh, uh, the schwab zeldovich formulation so right and the schwab zeldovich formulation recall comes with about 11 assumptions right and we, we did this adoption even when we started analyzing the premix flame structure uh, 
and we may went through some additional assumptions maybe about two or three right. So here again we will have to go through additional assumptions some of which I have already stated. So the first assumption so further assumptions further assumptions. Number one, if you now uh, set up a coordinate system that is centered at the mouth of the fuel duct in the middle and then say call this R and uh, call this Z, then let us say the Vz component of velocity is U which is a constant. right uh, given unlike in the case of premix flames where this is not given this is actually an eigenvalue you need to find out what is the uh, flow velocity at which you need you, you have a flame that is stabilized we do not have to worry about the flame stabilization problem in the case of uh, in, in the case of the diffusion flame as it is posed by Burke and Schumann and that is very important for you to think about. Um, we will have to see later on what the stabilization mechanism is and we will bring in some elements of premixedness that is coming up that is the reason why we call it it is not exactly entirely a diffusion flame we would simply call it a non premix flame. Um, but so we will not worry about stabilization issues this is given and uh, correspondingly we say vr is equal to 0 that means you do not have any radial velocities strictly speaking this is not true if you were to allow for the density to vary with temperature you will now have the, the flow diverge similar to the way the, the we saw in the conical premix flame and that will acquire a radial velocity, velocity component but we are, we are disregarding this right. Um, the second assumption is um, the mass fluxes um, are equal. that is uh, rho v fuel equals rho v oxidizer right. Now putting things together what this basically means is that if the velocities of the two flares are the same right and this is the velocity field that is given there that and that means the fuel and uh, oxidizer all of them have both of them have the same velocity if the say if the velocities are the same and the mass fluxes are the same that is that is simply means that the densities are the same and densities being the same is essentially what it amounts to saying the density does not vary right. So the density does not vary not only because of temperature but also because originally the densities were the same so you do not really have to worry about any change in density in the first place. And how, do, how does that is it is it possible is it possible to have a fuel and oxidizer of the same density right. The answer is in the laboratory it is possible to mix the fuel and oxidizer with different diluents in such a way that you achieve the same density for these diluted mixtures of fuel and oxidizer right. So we say why if not and why will not. So in this you have basically fuel with a diluent because 1 minus y, y of naught should be the diluent. In the outer at annular duct you are having 1 minus y one naught is a, is a diluent. You could choose these diluents in such a way that the densities are the same right. The next assumption is certainly a simplifying assumption um, which is rho d is a constant and this simplification is required for a, from a mathematical standpoint right and of course what this means is that if the density is constant uh, d must be the same everywhere okay that is that is part of the schwab zeldovich formulation anyway right. So we are not looking at variation in d across the fourth assumption um, is diffusion in the axial direction is negligible 
diffusion in the axial direction is negligible that means we are saying it is negligible relative to the radial diffusion okay. So that means we are saying wherever we have a do uh, do uh, z squared is much less when compared to partial squared yi over partial r squared right. Now this is to basically say that we are interested only in retaining the radial diffusion the convection is axial because we have disregarded any radial convection by this assumption right. So we are, we are prescribing a velocity field that is only axially convective and we now permit only radial dif diffusion so that we can clearly see the balance between axial convection and radial diffusion. I want to point out that this assumption is not necessary you could keep the radial diffusion and, and, and sorry we, we could keep the axial diffusion and show that the axial diffusion is important when you have a small Peclet number or it is negligible truly when compared to the radial diffusion at for large Peclet numbers and large could be for lamina flows greater than 10 is, is, is large enough greater than 10, 10, 20 or 50 maybe is large enough right uh, but less than 5 is something that you have to keep and what I will do is I will keep talking about the consequences of retaining the, um, re the axial diffusion um, but I will not solve that problem all right and it is interestingly um, I think in 19 this, this was actually published in 1928 as I said I think it is 1982 or 84 there was a combustion science and technology paper uh, by Chung and Law that actually publishes the, 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 the solution with axial diffusion retained okay. So the, the interesting thing about these things is as and when people make more and more assumptions long later there could be somebody who relaxes an assumption and then you, you, know, you now have a expanded version of this or a more general version of this solution that is that, possible. As a matter of fact um, we were talking about a Berkshuman problem adopting the schwab zelda which formulation which essentially is a steady state uh, uh, problem right. So we are looking at a steady state situation that means this, this flame is not going to change shape with, with time and uh, very recently in about uh, 3, 4 years ago we, we relaxed the steady state assumption and actually did an oscillatory diffusion Berkshuman flame all right. So uh, what, I, what I mean to say is uh, you, you could relax many of these assumptions and solve the Berkshuman problem. And these things over a period of time begin to uh, come into your exams and homework problems and assignments and all those things right. The fifth assumption is perhaps the most important and insightful assumption that needs to be considered. What we are thinking here is we, we say um, what are the right words yes it is called the flame sheet assumption. right flame sheet assumption means similar to how we adopted the G equation where we said the flame is essentially going to be a sheet it is a surface of discontinuity between reactants and products in the case of the premix flame as I said in this problem we are interested only in the shape we are not interested in the structure so it is sufficient for us to think about like a sheet right therefore we want to actually make the assumption that the flame is going to be a sheet the question is what is it that we are going to do in the equations that implements this assumption right what is the consequence of this assumption in, ter in terms of our analysis what does it really mean okay physically what this really means is this directly corresponds to what is called as infinite rate chemistry infinite rate chemistry or infinite kinetics infinite kinetics the other other name for this is what is called as the mixed is burnt uh, 
mixed is burnt um, approach. So this requires some explanation. What we are basically saying is and this is very very important this assumption means means that the reactants react instantaneously when the mix in stoichiometric proportions Okay. And again that, that needs to be further explained. What we mean by stoichiometric uh, proportions is you now have the fuel and oxidizer that are mixing right. So if you now think about even like a splitter plate problem let us suppose you did not even have these walls right you simply had only a splitter plate and this is a semi infinite domain that is a semi infinite domain and you had a plate that just stopped here and you had all fuel coming in this side all oxidizer coming in that side this is to say we are focusing on one lip here right let us not worry about what is what is on the other side. Then slowly what is happening is as the fuel and oxidizer are actually flowing out they are beginning to mix right. So as they begin to mix if you are somewhere very far away you are not going to know that they are mixing that means it is all fuel if you are on this side very far away you are not going to know that they are, they are mixing it is all oxidizer but as you keep going from here to there all oxidizer becomes all fuel through a state where you have a mixture right that means there is going to be some particular contour where the fuel and oxidizer are actually finding themselves mixed in stoichiometric proportions right and what we are saying in this assumption is the flame is going to be a sheet that is coincident with the stoichiometric contour in the mixing field right. So let us just write that <coughs> the flame is a sheet coinciding with the stoichiometric contour in the mixing field. We will elaborate this a, little, a lot more after we go through the Berkshuman solution but at the stage I think I will just give you a peek of what is going to happen. Let us suppose that we do not have this assumption and we have what is called as a finite rate chemistry or finite kinetics. Okay. And that is what is reality. In reality, if you now work out the Arrhenius law or the law of mass action for the reaction rates, you are going to get some number, right? Then that number is going to be large, all right, for most combustion things, but it is still finite. Let us say, let us say it is finite. As the fuel and oxidizer are getting together, right, you are going to have more and more reactions happening if you find sufficient amount of fuel and oxidizer at a place because the law of mass action requires for the reaction rates to have concentrations of both fuel and oxidizer. If you went little bit farther away and you found that you you had only fuel and not, no, not, not much oxidizer that is mixed in you are going to have the reaction rates drop substantially. If you go on this side and you find that you have more of oxidizer and you, you did not have hardly any fuel mixed, mixed to all the side you are not going to have concentration of fuel the, the reaction rates are going to drop substantially. As a matter of fact if you think about the premix flame you had a certain reaction zone thickness which was restricted because you are running out of the deficient fuel that means the reaction constant reactant concentration comes almost to 0 right here the reactant concentration comes to 0 from opposite sides for the two reactants there both the reactants were actually coming from the same side of the flame here the two reactants are coming or diffusing from opposite sides of the flame. So both reactants will have to actually go to zero concentration on either side and then that, that is going to restrict the region of your reaction zone right. Where is it going to be like 
highly reactive. So if you now think about the reaction rates, they are kind of hitting 0 at these ends where you are running out of, of fuel on one side and running out of oxidizer on the other side and you now have a peak in the reaction rate along the stoichiometric surface, right. That is where they are available in equal abundance so to speak, right. Then we now say well let us want to have a flame sheet, I do not want to have thick flame. Right. So, if you want to have a flame sheet, I now have to collapse this to a particular to a sheet, right. Why would I collapse it? Obviously, at the stoichiometric surface. Therefore, we can imagine that this is a remarkable insight that Burke and Schumann had back in 1928 when you know there was not too much combustion theory that was going on at the time, right. So, the flame sheet obviously now can be convincingly thought of as coinciding with the stoichiometric surface in the mixing field. If you now assume this we have a extremely simplified situation which is we do not have to solve the combustion problem at all it is sufficient for us to solve the mixing problem. It could be as if we are doing a cold flow mixing without igniting So you just have to send the fuel in, you just don't have to send, send the oxidizer there, they mix and then they will, they will mix at a stoichiometric proportion, wherever they are mixing in stoichiometric proportion is where the flame is supposed to be, right, whether you ignite it or not, <laughs> okay. I just want to find that. Therefore, I do not have to actually worry about the energy equation along with the species e equation. In fact, it is sufficient for me to actually worry only about the species equation of the fuel and oxidizer, I do not even have to worry about other species, right and see how the species dynamics is going to work out for fuel and oxidizer alone, I do not worry about energy. So in the schwab zeldovich equation set of n plus 1 equations, I will just focus only on 2 equations which correspond to the species conservation of fuel and oxidizer alone and then work out the mixing problem, right. So this is how this is going to happen. So the schwab zeldovich set we just consider the species conservation equations of fuel and oxidizer species only and first of all for any species your, your, your uh, schwab zeldovich formulation is divergence of rho e y i minus rho d grad y i equals omega um, omega omega i or, or I think we have, we have the symbol w i that is w i right and what you are going to consider here is i equals o and f. This is a step before we form the alphas and the betas if you go back to the schwab zeldovich formulation right. So, for, for the sake of refreshing your minds this is the species equation the schwab zeldovich species equation okay and then we formed an alpha such that you, you will now divide these by something and get only a omega here and that, that is common for all the right hand sides and we would also do a particular alpha t for the energy equation which you are not going to consider here so that you will still get an omega there. And then you can start subtracting one from the other to and, and by forming betas which are like alpha minus alpha 1 or something of that sort. We will try to do something like that here uh, right now but at the moment we are going to consider only i equals o and f we do not we do not worry we do not we do not worry about um, anything else at the moment. So we now form the alphas so let us say we have a alpha i which is y i divided by w i nu i single prime 
Now of course the uh, schwab zeldovich formulation is for a single step reaction so single step reaction we are looking at is nu f f plus nu o o gives products we are interested only along this only the only only the stoichiometric surface and the stoichiometric surface this is the stoichiometric reaction right so nu f and nu o or stoichiometric coefficients of f and o okay such that you get only products you don't get anything more right and uh, therefore in this case if you now compare this with the template reaction uh, uh, reaction that we have which is like uh, nu i single primes sigma i equals 1 to capital n so nu i single primes script m i gives uh, uh, sigma i equals 1 to capital n nu i double prime script m i uh, and that is where you will get your nu i double prime minus nu i single prime for the alpha definition um, here nu i um, equal to nu i double primes are equal to 0 and uh, nu i single prime are essentially nu f and nu o okay uh, which means alpha f equals minus y f divided by w f nu f and alpha o equals minus y o divided by w o nu o all right and uh, and uh, w i divided by w i capital w i nu i double prime minus nu i single prime is equal to omega right therefore we get divergence of rho v y f uh, sorry you can, you can you can directly write alpha f alpha f minus rho d gradient alpha f equals omega and divergence of rho v vector alpha o minus rho d gradient alpha o equals omega. So now form beta this is the last step in the schwab zeldovich formulation in this case we now say let beta equals alpha f minus alpha o if you do this then we get divergence of rho v beta minus rho d gradient beta equal to 0 this is amazing because this is a combustion problem where we do not have to solve we do not have to consider chemical reactions okay and look at what we have been doing so far the last time we solved the schwab zeldovich formulation for a premix flame we looked at the preheat zone separately from the reaction zone and in the preheat zone we had a convective diffusive balance which means we had to consider convection and diffusion only and in the reaction zone we had a reactive diffusive balance which means we had to consider only the diffusion and reaction only. The full combustion problem in general always has a minimum of convection diffusion and reaction these are the three elements that constitute combustion primarily right. We escaped try, trying to solve all three of them together at the time by dividing it into two parts where we consider two of them to get uh, at a time and here on the whole we are, we are evading the consideration of reaction rates completely and we are looking at it as only a convective, convective diffusive balance except here we are going to specifically say it is a axial convection versus a radial diffusion right. So it is a the two dimensional problem and therefore that allows us to actually make these distinctions between axial convection and radial diffusion uh, but there is a one dimensional problem so we did not have that liberty okay. So, 
this is this is the this is a hallmark of classical combustion solutions we try to avoid situations where we have to deal with all three of them together that is what is called as a mixed problem okay so we try to avoid these mixed problems you always consider two processes at a time balancing each other wherever that is possible and you now get in this context a homogeneous linear equation right and we now adopt cylindrical polar coordinates so far we have not done that in the governing equations adopt adopt cylindrical polar coordinates use v vector is equal to u e z cap and uh, dou squared beta over dou z squared much less when compared to dou squared beta dou r squared that is going to happen here in the second term right. So with all these assumptions we are simply going to have u divided by d partial beta over partial z equal to 1 over r partial derivative with respect to r of r partial beta over partial r. This is the, the r component of the Laplacian in cylindrical polar coordinates and uh, so it is a bit complicated there because of uh, the cylindrical polar coordinates. Now for the first time we need to worry about boundary conditions we got the simplified governing equation which is this and let us now look at the boundary conditions okay. The boundary condition that we require is in beta okay so we need boundary condition for beta, beta is now our single variable and it is a single equation that is governing it and we need boundary condition for beta in r and z okay and since it is governing governed to second order in z sorry r you need two boundary conditions and since it is governed to first order in z you need two bound you need only one boundary condition in z right. So if you now look at the boundary conditions that are supposed to be in r for the two boundary conditions now we have to look at what is the domain. The domain for us is going from r equal to 0 to r equals let us say uh, you want to now distinguish between the inner um, duct radius so let us call this A and uh, the outer duct radius which is B. So our domain is going from R equals 0 to R equals B so we have to supply a boundary condition at R equal to 0 right and that is a symmetry boundary condition so B, B, C at um, for, all, for all Z right at r equal to 0 partial beta over partial r is equal to 0 this is the symmetry boundary condition all right. Now what is partial well, what is the first derivative of beta actually imply physically if you now go back beta is nothing but alpha f minus alpha o and what is alpha alpha is y f divided by w f nu f and sim similarly um, alpha o. So this ultimately goes back to taking partial derivative of r of y f and y o with respect to r right. So partial derivatives of mass fractions amount to diffusion fluxes right. So what we are saying by symmetry that uh, partial beta over partial r should be equal to 0 means that you do not have diffusion across the center line because of symmetry right. So whatever is happening here should actually have be the same thing that happens there and if you now have a diffusion over here that means that also means that you have to allow for diffusion from that side to this side that indicates an accumulation which is not possible right. So you need to have that is what symmetry boundary condition is all about it is physical okay and at r equals v you have a wall and when you have a wall 
you can't have species diffuse species is not going to convect the, uh, across because you have only uh, you that's like kind of like the no slip of, I shouldn't say no slip this is like a inverted flow that is slipping past the wall but it doesn't penetrate the wall by convection but it can't diffuse this is a diffusion problem therefore we still have to say that partial beta over partial r is equal to 0 this is wall bc okay no diffusion across the wall now what we have seen here is we have two Neumann boundary conditions right we have to count on the third boundary where, where we need to have a boundary condition which is z equal to 0 to provide something Dirichlet so that we will be able to peg the value of the problem if you had Neumann BC here as well then you, your, your, your solution will not be unique right in order to get a unique solution we should look for uh, some, some Dirichlet boundary condition on, 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 on uh, at the burner lip right here at z equal to 0 which we will consider tomorrow.